In 1900, Britain formed the Northern Nigeria Protectorate and the Southern Nigeria Protectorate. By 1914, the Northern Nigeria Protectorate had a budget deficit, so the British sought to offset this deficit with the surpluses from the Southern Nigeria Protectorate. Thus, a unified colony and protectorate of Nigeria was created with no consideration for the cultural differences in the two areas among the Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa people, among many others. By 1960, Nigeria became an independent nation. The North and South wanted to be their own independent nations, given their cultural and religious differences. However, the British sought to preserve Nigeria as a whole. Eager for independence, the two sides agreed and elections were held. These elections were rigged in favor of northern politicians that were friendly to the British, whose economic interests in Nigeria were in the oil BP and Shell were extracting. Over the years, tensions escalated, and by 1967, a civil war broke out. This war is known as the Biafran War, where the state of Biafra fought with the state of Nigeria for independence. Representing the nationalist aspirations of Igbo people, led by Chukwemeka Otomegu Ojuku. Hello, my name is Lucas, this is a bit of lit, and I'm here to talk about Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun, which is a fantastic historical fiction novel about the Biafran War in Nigeria in the late 60s. And I provided a little bit of context at the beginning of the video to explain uh, a little bit about how this event came to happen. Uh, I did leave tons out, I mean, just of an insane amount of information uh, I left out. I wanted to keep it uh, sort of bare bones just to give you a base to build on. The book certainly gives a lot more context um, and I will be reading more about it eventually because it's a very fascinating subject and this book has created an interest in me for more uh, Nigerian history, African history as a whole as well in general. Um, I do make these kind of videos to provide context every now and then. If you would like to see that more, then, uh, you know, let me know, uh, comment, share, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. I would greatly appreciate it. If I got anybody's name uh, wrong by pronunciation or you feel like I left something out that would be really important to understanding the context of this uh, civil war, this tragedy, um, then, you know, let me know. Uh, I did look up some videos for how to pronounce uh, these names, uh, the Biafran leader and the author in particular. But uh, I always feel unsure because I'm unfamiliar with these names. So, you know, I, I do want to do right by them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just, I'm a little nervous about that. Uh, anyway, I've got my notes over here. Uh, this story follows five main characters through the perspective of three narrators, Olana, uh, Ugu, and Richard, and the other two characters are Odenigbo, who's like a revolutionary socialist professor at Nsuka University, who's in favor of Biafra becoming an independent state for the Igbo people, and uh, Kainin, who is the twin sister of Olana, who's got a little bit of a cold heart in a way, and she starts off as a war profiteer at the beginning of the novel and slowly uh, changes and realizes the tragedy that this is and starts to run a refugee camp. Uh, this story moves around through the 60s. Sometimes it's early in the 60s, sometimes it's later, then it goes back and then it goes uh, you know, back in time, and then it goes into the future. Um, and it starts off with Ugwu, who's a young boy from a, a village who becomes house servant for Odenigbo. Uh, and he comes to really appreciate this lifestyle and doesn't want to let it go. Uh, he becomes envious of Olana, uh, who's the daughter of Chief, Chief Ozobia uh, and went to study in the UK. Envious because now uh, his master's attention uh, is being directed toward this uh, beautiful young woman. Uh, 
and that relationship becomes quite complicated and tense uh, once tensions rise in the country and Odinigbo cheats on her with another woman uh, impregnating her and they later adopt this baby uh, girl and because of this stress before they have this adoption um, Olana seeks comfort in Richard who is a writer from the UK uh, and our white character uh, and the lover of her sister Kainim. Um, so <laughs> it's uh, got a lot of melodrama in this way but it does a really fantastic job of showing like all these different people with different perspectives from different uh, places in life and um, you know how they react and what they want and what they get out of it. Uh, at the, 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 it's broken up into a couple different sections, and the, at the beginning of each section, it's written like a like a different book in a way. Um, and it the these chapters or these chapter beginnings provide a lot of historical context that will explain uh, sort of the international response. Uh, and what the British wanted out of keeping a united Nigeria and, you know, the horrors of this uh, tragic civil war and that kind of thing. And yeah, like I said, the international response, what the Americans were doing, what the Soviets were doing, what, what uh, all these different nations were doing. Um, and yeah, it lets us know about the geopolitical effects of the British decolonizing Nigeria. It does a really good job of showing that even though a country has been decolonized, there are deep, long-lasting after-effects that come from uh, that war, or that crime against humanity um, that don't just go away because the place is no longer directly ruled by the colonizing country um, and the British wanted to have access to oil production still uh, and have a good deal for it though it seems that in the south that's where a lot of the oil is produced uh, but they wanted northern politicians a house of people who are conservative and I guess uh, Islamic and had a hierarchy with emirs that the the British uh, used to uh, <laughs> control things I guess from what I understand from what I read um, in some articles uh, so yeah and because of this there there becomes a lot there comes a lot of prosecution and persecution of Igbo people I was reading, there were some pogroms where lots of Igbo people were killed uh, even before the Civil War started and, you know, uh, some policies that don't really help uh, people in the South, for example, and, you know, these kind of things raise a lot of tensions and that's where Igbo nationalism and independence and where Biafra comes from. But it is quite complicated. Um, but it does seem like uh, these people were quite oppressed from what I read, so I understand uh, why they would do that. Um, as the book goes on, we see more and more and more and more horrors and little... Each time we see some small thing, everything gets significantly worse because it is war. Um, there is this really great poem uh, that is shared by one of the characters in the book that's in the one of the pages at the beginning of a part of a section um, that I think really shows like the sharp criticism of uh, journalists uh, from America or wherever uh, the UK uh, coming in and what they were doing and I would like to read that part. Did you see photos in 68 of children with their, hairs be with their hair becoming rust? Sickly patches nestled on those small heads, then falling off like rotten leaves on dust? 
Imagine children with arms like toothpicks with footballs for bellies and skin stretched thin. It was quashiorcor, difficult word, a word that was not quite ugly enough, a sin. You needn't imagine there were photos displayed in glass-filled pages of your life. Did you see? Uh, did you feel sorry briefly, then turn around to hold your lover or wife? Their skin had turned the tawny of weak tea and showed cobwebs of vein and brittle bone. Naked children laughing as if the man would not take photos and then leave alone. And, uh, you know, that really got to me. That, uh, I mean, a lot of it was already getting to me, but I realized, like, wait a second, I have heard about this war before. I've seen photos of um, this, and... Yeah, it was uh, sort of a reckoning in a way uh, for me to uh, to read that part in particular because I think the poem just had an extra impact uh, that made me realize, like, there are also some journalist characters who are, I want to punch them in the face. They make me so angry because they are so apathetic to what's actually going on because they're not worried about themselves. Uh, or, you know, even... If they're not worried about themselves being in danger, they're even less worried about... It seems that way, anyway. They're absolutely not worried about what's actually happening. They're just there for the job and whatever. And they're... They, they're very cold. And I hate them. But, um... Yeah, it does a really good job of showing that, like... Uh, this story... Uh, was just something in Life magazine for you to flip through the pages and then move on from. Uh, meanwhile, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people were suffering uh, from starvation, from war, and these kind of things. Um, and there's a casual coldness to it that is dehumanizing and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good book. It, it made me think a lot uh, about these kind of things. Uh, anyway, I recommend it. It's uh, definitely something I want to read more Nigerian literature, more African literature in general. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so that's all I've got to say. Uh, I didn't talk too much about what actually happens in it. Normally I do spoil a little bit more. It's about a war. You can read about what happened, but... Uh, maybe you can see what happens with the characters because they go through the ringer and it's just a It's a tragedy and it's really well written and you get to see every element of I mean Ugwu who is the sweetest kid ever He is constrip conscripted against his Against his will into the war and forced to do things that he couldn't possibly imagine uh, the the the, the Odenigbo, loses hope and loses himself when his mother dies and just devolves as a man. Uh, Kainin, like I said, changes from a war profiteer to trying to care for people in a refugee camp. And uh, it's been a couple weeks since I read it. Richard, uh, he feels a little bit more Biafran. He becomes more... <laughs> I remember him feeling more like a Biafran at the end or something like that. And, uh, Olana, I don't remember. It's been a couple, uh, it's been a couple weeks since I finished the book, actually. But, uh, they're all really interesting characters, and it's a great story, and, uh, it's a tragedy, and you will learn a lot, I promise you. Uh, and it's fantastic. And keep in mind, it's not something just to learn from. It is, uh, something to take in, learn from, and, uh, try to build a better future so these kind of horrors don't happen to anybody. Uh, not just people of your own country, but uh, other countries and that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, it's a sad book, though. Thank you. Goodbye.